Sabbath. It is good to see your faces out there. It is uh, a blessing to be able to be uh, present together and worship the Lord together this morning. Amen. Um, how many of you went home last night thinking about your weapons? Amen. Amen. Uh, beloved, this morning we have a very crucial message. And I believe that this message, rightly accepted, rightly received, can and will change your life forever. And I say that with all confidence, beloved, because the Bible is our confidence. Amen? And so I want to just ask that as we prepare for God to speak to us this morning, that we would search our own hearts and ask the Spirit of God to cleanse us, to open our ears that we may be able to hear. Amen? So I'm going to kneel up here. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads as I pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, because you love us so much. Father, I am so excited about the message you have to share with your children this morning. Speak to us, Lord. May our hearts burn as you draw near. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> the title of my message this morning is a long one, but I hope you remember it. Chain reactions and the verity of the third angel's message. Chain reactions and the verity of the third angel's message. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation, the 20th chapter, and we will begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great... I want to make sure you have your Bibles and you're following me. So when I pause, that means you speak loud. Amen? All right, good. Let's try it again. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, <clears throat> having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And I want to tell you, but before we read any further, that the devil is terrified of this chain. Some of you know why, some of you may not, but you will understand why as we read on. The Bible says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and did what? Bound him a thousand years. Anybody waiting for the devil to be bound? <laughs> and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived or came to life and reigned with Christ. How long? A thousand years. It becomes obvious that we're talking here about the resurrection. The resurrection is, is, is synonymous with that event of the angel with the chain in his hand bounding the devil because both of those events begin the period of time that we just saw seen or known as the 1,000 years. Amen? So at the same time that Jesus returns is the same time that those who died for Christ, are resurrected and caught up, and it's the same time that the devil is bound with this what? Chain. And so, beloved, the question is, what is it 
that brings about this event. In other words, let me rephrase it, could there be a chain of events that leads to this angel with the chain in his hand that will in essence bound Lucifer? Let me rephrase that another way. What is the chain reaction that brings about the binding of the devil? This morning, I want to share with you that chain reaction. It begins, beloved, the, 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 the final event, the thing that springs off that chain reaction that the devil fears so much begins with the verse that we had read to us this morning. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I want you to notice verse 13 and 14. When you get there, please say amen. The Bible says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall what? Humble themselves and do what? Pray. And seek my face. And turn from their what? Wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Beloved, the, 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 the event that catapults this chain reaction that brings about that angel in Revelation chapter 20 with the chain in his hand that bounds the devil is God's people actually getting together, humbling themselves, turning from their wicked ways, and praying for God to pour out the rain. We are told again in the book of Joel, you don't need to turn there, but in the book of Joel we are told, call a solemn assembly, sanctify. The elders, it goes on to describe this, this, this solemn assembly that is to take place. And if you read further down in the book of Joel, the Bible says that when God's people do that, he will send to them the former rain and the what? And the latter rain. And beloved, you know the devil fears the latter rain. And I want to digress here very briefly to tell you what's happening. Some of you know what's happening, some of you do not. I just want to share with you very briefly. A few months ago, a grassroots movement started calling God's entire church to pray for 10 days for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And beloved, this movement that started from the grassroots has now found its way to Australia, to Africa, to England, to the islands. It is spreading rapidly. And beloved, I can just sense that the devil is fearful. Now, the date set for this event is June 27th to July 07. It is like a net event, but without a keynote speaker. Who was a keynote speaker at Pentecost? Nobody. <laughs> they got together and what? Prayed. Nothing else but prayed. And you know, beloved, I believe that we have gotten to the place in this church's history where we are man-focused. Who's going to be a speaker? No speaker? Oh, okay then. I guess no meeting. Beloved, during those 10 days, there was no keynote speaker for the early church. All they did was get together and pray. And so, beloved, we are seeing what could possibly be the beginnings of a worldwide revival. Will anything happen during those 10 days? Guess what? 
I don't know. None of us can predict when God is going to move, when God will do what he... It's, that's in God's time, but it's our work to get ourselves ready. Amen? It's interesting that Ellen White wrote these words. In visions of the night representations pass before me of a great reformatory movement among God's people. Is there to be a great reformatory movement among God's people in the future? Yes. She goes on to say, many were praising God. The sick were healed and other miracles were wrought. A spirit of intercession was seen even as was manifested before the great day of Pentecost. Is there to be a time in this church where there will be a spirit of prayer that was manifested just like it was during the great time of Pentecost? Yes. I heard voices of thanksgiving and praise and there seemed to be a reformation such as we witnessed in 1844. That's incredible, beloved. You know what happened in 1844 and the years just previous to that? There was a global movement. People from all over planet Earth were saying, man, something's going to happen. We're not sure what it is, but it caught fire and it spread throughout the whole globe. Is that to happen again? Yes. How many of you are looking forward to the day? I want you to realize that, beloved, when this event happens, and this may be the event, it may not. We may not be ready. But when this event that is prophesied in the Bible takes place, what will happen is that because there is a global movement of God's people praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that global movement will lead to a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, there were 120 disciples praying in one area, Jerusalem. And the Spirit was poured out where? In Jerusalem. But in the last days, we are told, according to Revelation chapter 18, verse 3, that the glory that will fall will lighten the whole world, which would mean that there must be people across the whole world praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so, beloved, the global cry to God, the global uh, 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 pleading for the Holy Spirit will lead to a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What does that lead to? The global outpouring of the Holy Spirit leads to a global loud cry. Let me ask you, if I yell up here, will it be loud? If I asked the whole front row to yell with me, would it be louder? If I asked everyone in this room to yell with me, would it be louder? If we asked the whole world to yell at the same time, <laughs> if we asked the whole Adventist church to shout at the same time, would you consider that a loud cry? Ooh. <laughs> Can you imagine God's church in every city, in every village, on every continent, praying at the same time for the same thing, having the Spirit of God poured out at the same time, and in a matter of days and weeks, they are out in their own villages, in their own cities, preaching the message with power. Can you imagine everyone in this room suddenly endowed with that Pentecostal power that allowed Peter to convert 3,000 people in one message? Can you imagine that happening across the entire globe at the same time? You know, beloved, that says to me that God's people would get to the place where they're no longer waiting for our top evangelist or evangelist to go over to Africa to preach a message. <laughs> We're waiting for television to do what God is waiting for us to do. 
And so, beloved, you've got this global outcry for the Holy Spirit. And then you've got this global outpouring of the Spirit, which leads to a global loud cry. And, beloved, the global loud cry will lead to a global exodus. Revelation 18, the Bible tells, tells, the Bible says there that the message to go forth is this, come out of her, my people. Now, beloved, I want you to imagine this. You know those people of those other faiths you've been trying to reach with the gospel message? And it's just been so difficult. Imagine, beloved, when the Spirit of God is poured out upon you, you know, those people who have been worshiping this God and those people who have been worshiping that God, all of a a sudden, your words are going to be so filled with the Spirit of God that these people will be converted by the thousands. Oh, can you begin to see why the devil would hate to see this chain reaction go off? All of a sudden, thousands of all the religious bodies of the world are going to be losing their members. Oh, man. And, beloved, I I, I want you to understand that, that while we will be celebrating, yes, praise the Lord, look at the numbers that are coming in, genuine conversions, beloved, there is a downside to that. Because you see, this global exodus will lead to global persecution. You see, when the leaders of the various movements are saying, where are all our people going? What is this? In a week, we've just been cut in half. What's going on? And you got the religious mo- leaders of this movement, and you got the religious leaders of that movement, and they're all wondering, where is this all coming from, when suddenly their attention will be turned to a relatively small group of people. Are these the ones that in a matter of days and weeks and months have robbed us of our Let me read to you a powerful statement taken from the great controversy. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standards and therefore awakes no opposition. You want to know why you have it good right now? (laughs) You want to know why key people in leadership positions (laughs) of the world have good things to say about you right now? Listen, The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostle. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Now here's the kicker sentence. Let there be a revival of faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution rekindled. Why are we not seeing persecution right now here in America? Why are we seeing persecution, beloved? It's because of the spirit of what? Compromise. But I'm not here to talk about that in particular this morning. I want to make the devil mad for a little while. Is that okay? So, so let's get back to this chain reaction thing. Once God's people put away their sins and get ready and cry out to God, and once they, 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 the outpouring of the loud rain falls, and once that loud cry goes forth, and once that global exodus takes place, then you have this global persecution. And we're actually told, you know, this is amazing. Listen to this. Great Controversy, page 606. In amazement, this is during the loud cry. 
In amazement, they, that is those who belong to Babylon, who are sincere in heart. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. And the people go to their former, I'm sorry, as the people go to their former teachers with the eager inquiry, are these things so? The ministers present fables and prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and to quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand a plain thus saith the Lord, the popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan and will stir up the sin-loving multitude to revile and persecute those who proclaim the truth. So, beloved, the loud cry goes forth. People are saying, wow, we've never heard things like this. Or maybe I heard it before, but it just didn't make sense. Man, I'm out of here. But wait, let me go talk to my teacher first. Pastor, can you are these things really so? And with no answer to give, it will only arouse fury. And it is this fury that now, the, remember, beloved, listen, it was after Egypt or after Israel left Egypt that aroused Pharaoh's fury to destroy them. So likewise, as the loud cries going forth, the fury, Satan will, will imbue his messengers with a satanic fury. And now all of a sudden, global attention is focused on who? You. But praise God, when global persecution, <laughs> let me hold my sentence there. I want to read one more quote from the Great Controversy, page 607. The power attending the message, that's the loud cry, the latter rain power, will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means of their, at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of the vital questions. Everybody's going to be talking about it. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. Now, I don't know if you caught that. The Sunday law is invoked specifically because of you. It's not just a bunch of people sitting out there, hmm, you know what, I think a Sunday law would be good. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. No, do you remember when Daniel was being faithful in his kingdom, in, in the kingdom of the Babylonians, and the wise men said, you know what, we're trying to get Daniel down. We're trying to get rid of him, but we can't find anything wrong with him. We're going to have to pass a law specifically targeted to get Daniel in trouble. You see, beloved, here's why I'm explaining that, because many of us are waiting for a Sunday law to spring us into action. There it is, the Sunday law. Now let's go. We're waiting on the Sunday law, and the Sunday law is waiting on us. <laughs> so we've been here for how many, what, 100 and, what, 50? Well, if we go back to 1888, then we can say 100 and almost 120 years. We've been waiting for the Sunday law. And the Sunday law is waiting on us. See, beloved, the Sunday law is not passed until the people get so infuriated with us that they say, what can we do to persecute these people, to, to get rid of them? We know they keep the Sabbath. Let's pass a Sunday law. Chain reaction. But, beloved, we know, praise God, that when that universal Sunday law is passed, when that global persecution comes to a head, global persecution leads to global deliverance. Woo! And you know what global deliverance is, right? Revelation chapter 20, that angel comes with the chain in his hand. And, beloved, I like to call it a prayer chain. 
Beloved, it was the prayers of the saints that set off the chain reaction that brings about the angel with the chain in his hand that says, now it's time to bind you, Lucifer, because my people have shown me that they are ready. Chain reactions. Beloved, I believe we need to get this prayer chain going. Amen? And beloved, as I'm looking at what's happening around the world, let me share something exciting with you. The website is www.operationglobalrain.com. And I got to tell you something, I check the website like every day. Because I am so excited to see what's going on. That there's a map on the website, and I will click on that map, and you know, in a matter of like, like I think it was maybe... 15 days, it had already had, just from word of mouth, it had already had over 2,000 visitors. Just from word of mouth. And I'll go back there, and I am just amazed to see how quickly this thing is spreading. It is God and God only who is moving upon his people to partake of this. I see God's hand in it, beloved. And like I said, we may not be ready. I always say this, this may be the beginning of a yearly event. But, beloved, it could be the beginning of that chain reaction that brings about the devil's downfall. Amen? Amen. And so, Satan then must keep God's people from praying. That simple. The chain, that thing which sets off the chain reaction is 2 Chronicles 7.14. I said this before. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 must become to us what Daniel 8, 13 and 14 was to the early Advent movement. Did you get that just now? Not, not lessening Daniel 8, 13, 14. That, is, that has the highest significance and still does and always will. But beloved, I believe for us now, we are not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. To fulfill 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and 14. So it's amazing that, that as this, this vision has been shared, that, you know, people have said, but you know what, Pastor, there's a problem. And some of you have even sat in here even now and saying, yeah, but there's a problem, Pastor. <laughs> Pastor, there's a problem. That's a nice grand vision, uh-huh, yeah, but there's a problem. You don't know where we are. You don't know what's going on in my church. You don't know what, what the conference is doing here or, or, what, or what's happening over there. You don't know, Pastor. That will never happen. And you know what? Let me tell you, that is a great dilemma. Because, beloved, you will realize in Acts chapter 2, would you turn there with me, please? Acts chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter, and verse 1. I want you to notice the condition for the outpouring of the early rain. Acts, chapter 2, and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, let's read this together. They were all with one accord in one place. Now, beloved, I believe that the difference between the early rain and the latter rain in this verse, the only thing that changes about this verse is that it must read, or it would read, they were all in one accord in many places. That would be the only difference. So the challenge remains then, how in the world do we get the Seventh-day Adventist church to be on one accord? Ooh, that could cause you a headache, huh? <laughs> I mean, think about the dilemma. Some people say it's rock music, it's all right. You got others who are saying, no, it's not all right. Some people saying, hey, it's okay to wear whatever you want to wear. 
And others are saying, no, it's not okay to wear what you want to wear. And some people are saying, hey, it, human nature of Christ, was it pre-Adam or post-Adam? And some say, hey, you're wrong. It was pre- and, and, whoo, enough to cause you a headache. And we wonder how in the world, if we are waiting, if we are waiting for the church to agree on all these points before we get together and pray, how long do you think we're going to be here? We will be here forever. What is the problem? How are we going to deal, I should say, with this problem? You see, beloved, I tell you, the devil, he knows what he must do to stop the chain reaction. If he can keep God's people divided, if he can keep them from getting on one accord, the rain will never fall. But beloved, praise God, we are told that that's not going to happen. Somehow or another, we're going to figure out, oh, that's how it is. <laughs> because the word of God has prophesied it. Amen? So we can be happy and rejoice. We, you know, what is faith? Knowing without knowing how. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to happen, but I have faith that it's going to happen. Amen? Amen? But beloved, I want to share some excellent news with you this morning because I can tell you how it's going to happen. You can know how. Are you... Yeah, I just get excited sometimes. Forgive me. Forgive me. Let me tell you, beloved, how it happens. How is it that the church with all its differing fa uh, uh, factions can actually come together and fulfill Acts chapter 2 verse 1? The answer is found in a nutshell in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. What is it that we are told in the scripture unifies the people of God. Notice what it says, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Are you ready? Therefore, the Bible says, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace. Now, the Greek of that word actually means one. Okay, <laughs> let's try it again. Let's try it again. <laughs> we have one. <laughs> Oneness. That's what peace is. When you are, t when you are dwelling in peace with, with someone, you are dwelling in what? Oneness. So what we're being told here is that justification by faith brings us peace or oneness with God and therefore would bring us oneness with one another. Justification by faith. Now, now let me go back here and I want to read something to you. Go back with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. The Bible tells us something powerful here. We know that in our understanding, the Adventist church is commissioned to give how many messages? Three. The three angels' messages. And, and the loud cry is actually a, a, another angel. That angel of Revelation 18 joins his voice with the angel of, with the third angel's message. Amen? And that third angel's message reads, chapter 14, verse, verse um, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath, which, uh, of, the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast, his image, and whosoever receiveth his mark. And we like to stop right there and say, yep, that's the third angel's message. If you worship the beast, you will be destroyed. But beloved, the third angel's message does not end there. 
I want you to notice the next verse. Here is the what? The patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the what? Faith of Jesus. Now, beloved, as Seventh-day Adventists, we preach, we, we believe that the loud cry, we're going to go out there and tell the world, you must keep the what? Commandments of God. In fact, we're going to tell them, you have been breaking the commandments of God. And we think we do that, and we have done our work. Warn them, and then we have done all that we need to do. But beloved, I want to share with you that there is a reason why we are to preach the commandments of God and the what? The faith of Jesus. Let me show you the reason why. Go back with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. I want you to notice what Romans 3 verse 19 says. When you get there, please say amen. Romans chapter 3, and I want you to notice what the Bible says here. Now we know that what sort of things the law saith is saved to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be what? Justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, beloved, we can't go out there and tell people the, you are breaking the law and they're going to say, well, what do I do to be made right? What are we going to say to them? <laughs> Keep the law. No, no, listen to what it says. Let me rephrase that. Keep the law in order to be justified. Okay, is that better? Because, beloved, we've got to tell them to what? Keep the law. Amen? But keep the law in order to be justified? No, because by no, by uh, uh, no one shall be justified by the deeds of the law. Listen to what it goes on to say. But now, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Why do we need to include the faith of Jesus Christ in that loud cry? Because when we tell the world you are guilty of breaking the law, and they say, well, what's the answer? And we say, the faith of Jesus. The righteousness of Christ. How shall I be justified? They, it says, listen, verse 24, being justified, or what does justified mean anyway? What does justified mean? It means being made what? Right. So we're going out there saying, you're wrong for breaking the law. Okay, okay, what do I do? How do I be made right? Keep the law. <laughs> no. Yes, keep the law, but that's not what's going to make you right. You are justified by the faith of Jesus. You are justified by faith in him. Amen? And so, beloved, we now understand that the third angel's message is the message of justification by faith. Now, listen to this. Ellen White wrote in Evangelism, page 190, or rather review in Herald, April 1st, 1890. She says, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The third angel's message in verity. Now, here is why we are not ready to give the loud cry. Listen. This was so potent, I had to write it down and make sure I said it right. I, this is me, okay? Is that all right? I'm not reading the quote. I'm just telling you what I am saying to you, but I got to say it right so it comes across right. 
Okay. You ready? All right. We cannot give the third angel's message with power until we first live the third angel's message with power. Yeah. Okay, so we're going out there to the world. You're breaking the law of God. Well, what's the answer? You are justified by faith. By faith, you may be made right with God, and by being right with God, you now then fall in line with the commandments of God. Great, praise the Lord. Can I come to your church? Yeah, come on. Hey, I didn't know those two guys aren't talking. Hey, wait, what? You mean you got different groups in? But wait, wait, wait. you just told me that I was guilty of breaking the law of God. And from what I understand, keeping the law of God actually means to love my neighbor and to get along in peace and harmony and to all be on one accord. And now you're... Is there another church you have anywhere around? I'm not going to take you to this church. Let me... Come on, I got another church that you can... You see, beloved, we can't go out there and give the third angel's message until we first live the third angel's message. Now, I want you to listen to this powerful, powerful quote. This is, I think, this is the most powerful quote in all of Ellen White's writings. Are you sitting on the edge of your seat? This is to me the most... Faith I live by. Page 111. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If we fully understand what justification by faith means, the devil will have no power over us. You see, justification by faith tells us, according to Romans 5, 1, this is what brings God's people into what? Oneness. Remember, the disciples before Pentecost, they were arguing about who was to be the greatest. I am better than you because I'm a vegan. So God, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We know that when the Spirit falls, it's surely not falling on, on, on Peter because he's always getting himself in trouble. He's got a dagger on his side. That liberal? <laughs> and so there is this crisis going on among the disciples. Who will be the greatest? And beloved, listen to me. They are justifying. What's the word I just used? Justifying why they should be the greatest. And then we are told that this message of justification by faith, according to the Bible, rightly understood, brings that oneness that God can then pour out His Spirit upon His people. So, to begin our message this morning... I do this all the time. I want to share with you two crucial points of justification by faith. Number one, justification by faith is the key to one accord. It is the key to one accord. Let's see this from the cross. 
Christ justified us at the cross. Amen? Now, justified, you've probably heard this before, justified would mean something like, just as if I'd never sinned. So when Christ justified us, he treats us just as if I'd never sinned. Now, that's key, and that's crucial. Now, beloved, turn with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, and I want you to watch this, beloved. Was it an amazing thing that Christ justified us at the cross? Huh? Um, an amazing thing. But now, now, notice Romans chapter 5, and I want you to notice something even more amazing. Romans 5 and verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the godly. Ooh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Hold on one second. I know that you're not telling me that justified, that when Christ died at the cross, he was willing to treat the ungodly just as if they never sinned. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, and yet peradventure for a good man some will even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son. Did you catch that? Now, beloved, this is not to say that God saved everybody at the cross and now they're just saved and now it's a matter of them losing their salvation. No, God offered. Amen. At the cross, he offered this full and free justification. And all we have to do is accept it by faith. It's not justification, period. It's justification by faith. You don't just get it. You get it by faith. Now, you want to know something amazing? Christ justified us by faith. Did you catch that? Christ said, I know that you're a wicked, wretched sinner right now, but I'm going to have faith that you're going to accept my justification. So Christ couldn't look out there and say, man, you deserve it. I'm going to justify you. No, no, no. It took faith of Christ to look at me and say, I'm going to justify him. I'm going to treat him just as if he'd never sinned. Now, he may not act like that, and he may continue to go on through life acting like that and thus, you know, be rejected in the last final analysis, but nonetheless, I will treat him like that. So, to be justified means to be pardoned. Amen? Did you catch that? To be justified means to be pardoned. Now, the Bible tells us that if we have truly received, ooh, man, let me tell you something. The devil right now is trembling because of, you know, remember that prayer that somebody prayed okay, before? Let the, let the devil tremble. The devil right now is trembling at the words that are about to come out of my mouth. They're not my words. They're, they're words of inspiration. Amen? This is a, the devil's power is about to be broken if you let it. Watch this. God says, as I have justified you. <laughs> Somebody got it. So I want you to justify others. As I have treated you just as if you never sinned, 
I know the guy over there is listening to what you believe is ungodly. <laughs> I don't want to put words in God's mouth. <laughs> But regardless of that, I still want you to treat him just as if he never sinned. See, right now I can't pray with him because he's not following the counsel. And I, no, 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 we, we're not talking because you see, you know what he did to me? Like the guy who came to the, to, 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 to the master and said, Matt, oh, you, I, I know I owe you all this money. Please forgive me. And the master says, okay, I'm going to have mercy on you and I forgive you. And he walks out singing praises to God and then sees somebody that owes him money. A little bit compared to what he had been forgiven. And he grabs him. And he says, give me my money. But, but, No. You're going to pay. And beloved, how many times do we say to our brother and sister, you're going to pay? Forget, no, mm -mm. you're going to pay. You're going to grovel. You see, beloved, if we have truly experienced justification by faith, Here is the evidence that we have not truly experienced justification by faith when we refuse to forgive. When we refuse to love despite what they may be doing is wrong. You see, beloved, what this does is now it says, hey man, look, I know that you are this and I am that, but you know what? This is so important. Let's lay aside our differences and let's come together and treat each other just as if you had never sinned and let's pray, God, open our eyes. Give us your grace. Give us your spirit that we can come together on one accord on all the other things. Justify. By faith, do you realize how we treat people because of the coloring of their past? Did you hear what I just said? You know, husband and wife live in the house together, and the husband's going, man, I know you. She says something, and you're like, mm-hmm, I, I know exactly what that means. I know what you meant to say. And we come at each other with everything connected from the past. Do you imagine how many, can you imagine how many problems would be solved if husband and wife said, okay, we're going to start exercising justification by faith. I'm going to treat you just as if. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> just as if you had never sinned. Just as if you had never wronged me. Now, that may not change. That person may continue to wrong you. But I, because Jesus forgave me so much, I'm going to treat you just as if. Just as if. You know what that means? Let me read to you. Faith I live by, 111. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, then they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You see, beloved, it's our glory that puffs, up, puffs, up, puffs us up and says, well, I'm not, you, you're going to grovel before me before I forgive you. The work of justification by faith brings us to the point where we say, well, who am I for you to come asking forgiveness? That's now the attitude. Our glory is laid in the dust, and we now see our own nothingness. Man, I'm miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. And so are you. Hey, guess what? We can unite on our miserableness, our wretched... Yeah, we can agree on that. And if we can agree on that, then we don't have to worry about anything else. We agree on that and say, Lord, look, we're all miserable. You know what? 
<laughs> Ooh. Because, you know, the conservatives say, yeah. And no, it's not. That thou, O liberal. Oh, it doesn't say that. That thou are miserable, wretched, naked, blah. Not us, you. And the, cons- and the liberal says, oh, <laughs> he doesn't understand. <laughs> He doesn't realize that verse is talking about him, that old miserable wretched. (laughs) And nobody wants to claim being miserable and wretched. Why? Because we have not understood justification by faith, which lays the glory of man in the dust. So now, whether you are liberal or conservative, we are all miserable, wretched, blind, and naked outside of Christ. And now we say, boom, that's where we can unite on. Let's unite on our nothingness. And let me read it again. When men see their own nothingness, they are then prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The devil doesn't want you to understand justification by faith. Because when we understand it, his power is broken. Amen? But there is a second key to justification by faith. And that is... That justification by faith is the key to victory over sin. It is the key to victory over sin. Now you say, how so, Pastor? Listen. What does justify mean? It means to be made what? Right. It can also mean to defend. Right? To vindicate. Hey, I'm going to defend you. I'm going to justify you. I'm going to vindicate you. I'm going to justify you. That's what the word justify means. And I want to share with you, beloved, that the opposite of justification by faith is justification of self. You see, mankind's biggest dilemma is that he is always seeking to justify. Is anything wrong with justifying? Huh? No. He is always seeking to justify, but how? Justify by self. Hey, why aren't you talking to so-and-so? Because. What does because mean? There is a what? There is a reason. Because. Because is an attempt to what? Justify. Why did you eat of the tree? Answer? Because. Ever been in an argument? What do you do in the argument? (laughs) Because. Let me read something to you. And here is another statement that the devil is trembling before I read it. Listen. Listen. If you get this, you have the key to victory over sin. Does that sound exciting? Listen to this. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious and unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse be found for it or cause be shown for its existence it would cease to be sin. That's Great Controversy, page 492. Now you say, Pastor, what does that mean? Here's what it means. 
The devil has tricked us. He has told us that when we sin, there is a reason. In other words, sir, why'd you look at that pornographic magazine? Well, because of the picture that was on the front. What have we just done? Just even though we know it's wrong, we justified why we did the action. Did you catch that just now? In other words, we say there is a reason why I should look. And this is the reason. Because of what's on the front cover. Oh man, you're not getting it. <laughs> you see, beloved, justification of self, which is a counterfeit of justification by faith, simply says whenever I sin, there was a what? A reason. Now let's flip that around a little bit and let's see it from another perspective. If I believe that there is a reason to sin, then I will what? Sin. But if I begin to come to the understanding that there is never a reason to sin, Joseph, don't you know that here is a woman who's coming on to you? Isn't that a reason to just go ahead and just fall into temptation? You know what Joseph said in his mind? Oh, well, that's not a reason to sin. Oh, you, you, you. <laughs> Let me do it this way. Uh, let's see that I came up here and I just went like, and then somebody said to you, man, do you see what he just did? Why don't you go up there and fight him? What would you say? Well, that's not a reason to fight him, Right? Or, or, you know, if, 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 if I tripped and then somebody said, hey, man, you know, he, he doesn't deserve that. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you just get a whole bunch of people and just go over there and start spitting on them? And, and you, you'd be looking and saying, well, why would I do that? You see, beloved, when the devil comes to us with temptation, we respond by saying, ah, yes, that is a reason to do this, isn't it? Oh, what should I do? But, beloved, if we could begin to think like Jesus thought. Listen, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days hungry. Hungry. Say that with me. Hungry. Now, the devil said, Jesus, you are hungry. Now, I am sure that that is a reason for you to turn these stones into bread. And you know what Jesus said? He said, hungry? That's not a reason to eat when God says don't eat. Ooh. How would I just... So you mean to tell me that you want me to justify turning those stones into bread because I'm hungry? <laughs> You're silly. <laughs> now, in, in our mind, we're going, yeah, that's a re man. That's a reason to do it. But we are told that there is no reason for what? Sin. So we are tricked into thinking that, that there is a reason, and because we are always looking for the reason to sin, we fall into the sin itself. Beloved, let me put it into a formula for you. Where there is no... Where there is no... Uh, how can I do this here? Where there is no cause, there can be no effect. When you take away this equation, there is a reason to sin. When you take that away from the devil, when you turn it to the devil and say, you know what, I got a new concept now, there is, no, there is never a reason to sin, you, you have just broken the devil's power. So come on, Je watch Jesus demonstrate now justification by faith. All right, Jesus, here you are in the garden. A bunch of Roman soldiers have just come around you and roughed you up. Is that justification for you to get mad now? Jesus says, no. That would not be justifiable. 
How am I going to defend justifying that? Whew. Okay. Well, now here you are on your cross, and they're mocking you, Jesus, and they're telling you, come down from the cross if you think you're the Son of God. Surely, Jesus, that's a reason to get angry and to do what you need to do. And Jesus on the cross says, well, that's not justifiable. That's not a reason to get angry at them. That's not a reason to get mad. And, 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 and so he says, okay, Jesus, well, look, now your very own father has forsaken you. Surely that's a reason to sin. Whew. He's forsaken me, but how can I justify sinning because God has forsaken me? If indeed he did forsake me. You see, beloved, what justification by faith does is it gets rid of all of our justifications to sin. See, now I can only behave and do those things that are justifiable by God. That's what it means. Just, why are you justified for doing that? Oh, well, here's why. All my justification now comes from the what? What? Word of God. This is what it means to live the justified life. Amen. It means everything that I do is justifiable in Christ. So now all I got to do is walk throughout the day. Okay, the devil, you know, something happens. I just simply ask myself, can I justify this in Christ? Mm, nope, can't justify it, so I won't do it. But you must do it because your body is calling out for this. And before we would say, yes, my body is calling out for this, and therefore, that's a reason to fall into it. And now we say, oh, well, my body calling out for this isn't a reason for me to do it. My body calling out for this isn't a reason for me to think it here, isn't a reason for me to fall into the sin. I can't justify that. If I want to live the life of justification by faith, the Bible says that faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So thus I am justified by faith which comes by hearing the what? Word of God. So when the devil attacked Jesus, Jesus did justify himself, but he justified himself by saying it is written. That's justification by faith, beloved. You take away the reason for sin, and sin has no more dominion and power in your life. That's why the devil is so fearful that this truth be understood. Because the moment we understand that there's no reason for sin, we go, oh, <laughs> well, okay, I've just been sinning because I thought I had to. I just thought that's what the human race does. Jesus says, no, when I am in you, I justify you by faith, and in turn, I grant you power. Power. And that power, beloved, is based upon the words, it is written. In fact, that I may know in page 210 says this, it was the word, it is written. That Christ met every temptation of Satan in the wilderness, and armed with this weapon, he could say to the enemy, Thus far shalt thou come, and no further. And beloved, now get this. That's why the Bible says, By your words, you will be justified. You see, beloved, our words needs to be, It is written. As long as we do everything before it is written, then we're good. That means justified. Made right. We're trying to make ourselves right. I'm right. You're wrong. Jesus says, forget about justification by self and allow yourself to be justified by the word. So when people are accusing you and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you can say, you know what, man, I am justified by faith. I don't have to defend to you why I'm doing what I'm doing with the Word of God. It is in the Word of God, and though you may condemn me as guilty, I am free, and I can still love you because I am justified by faith and I have been justified by Christ so I can treat you as though you have never sinned, even though you just spit on me. 
the devil knows that his power will be broken if we accept justification by faith. Have you ever wondered how it is that Jesus could quote the Let me ask you this. Have you ever... All right, that's it. It is written. Oh, I sinned again. Hey, ever happened? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hey, come on. Have you ever said, you know, all right, that's it. I'm going to quote the word of God. I'm going to quote it. And, and, and you try to quote it in the face of a temptation. And it's like the devil says, well, Paul, I know. And Jesus, I know. But wh wh what's your name again? <laughs> Have we met before somewhere? Anybody? Here? Let, let, me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Jesus did not only quote the word of God, he was the quote. Okay? In the beginning was the word, and the word was what? With God, and the word was God. Jesus, <laughs> you know, you, 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 the quotation marks, Jesus was, he not only quoted the quote, he was inside the quotation marks. <laughs> He was the quote. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? He was the quote. He was the word. And so when he quoted, he wasn't quoting something that was outside of himself. He was the very thing that he was quoting. And listen to this, beloved. What does that mean for us? Christ's Object Lessons, page 100. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of the character. Did you realize that your character is to be transformed? And it is to be transformed by it is what? It is written, the scripture. But the question is, what is it to be transformed into? She goes on to say the Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin and the faith that springs up in the heart works by love to Christ conforming us in body, soul, and spirit to his own image. Our characters are to be transformed or conformed into the image of God's Son. Amen? But see, we're going to take this a step further today. Is that okay? What is the image of God's Son? The image of God's Son is the image of the word. All right, let's try it again. Take two. The image of God's Son is the image of the word. So what does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. The flesh became word. Let me rephrase that. The Word became flesh so that the flesh could become Word. Oh, man, come on. Beloved, the flesh became, the word became flesh so that the flesh could become word. When you and I are to be transformed or conformed to the image of God, we are supposed to become the quote. The word of God is the seed, amen? What do orange seeds produce? Oranges. So if the word of God is the seed... And we are told in 1 Peter 1, 23, that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but by the what? Word of God. That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. That which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. That which is born of the word ooh, <laughs> is word. Are you word? When people see you, do they see the gospel? Or are you outside of the quotes trying to quote the quote? In the name of Jesus, leave me alone. <laughs> 
Beloved, it's time for us to stop quoting the quote outside the quote and become the quote. You know what that means? It means let the word of God dwell richly in you. And beloved, when we become the word, and I'm not talking about the word, I am the word. Please don't walk around saying I am the word, okay? (laughs) Don't do that. But when we allow ourselves to be transformed into his word, beloved, that's when we are ready to give a loud cry. If God's people accept justification by faith, we will be ready to unite together. We will be ready to gain the victory over every sin. And we will be ready to give a loud cry. I want to make an appeal. Beloved, you have heard the third angel's message in verity. When we go out to the world, we can't just tell them you're guilty of breaking the law of God. They need an answer. What do I do about breaking the law of God? And we can't tell them, keep the commandments to be justified. They've got to keep the commandments, but that's not what justifies them. And so today, you are treating someone just as if You are treating someone just as how you would not want God to treat you. There is somebody that you're not talking to among your brethren. Peter said, Lord, how many times shall I give, forgive my master? I mean, my, my brother, 70 times 7. And you know the contents of how he said that? Just the verse before, Jesus said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, anything you ask, I will answer it. And then Jesus said, Peter says, well, what if one of my brothers who you want me to gather with, what if he's been offending me all the time? How am I supposed to get together with him then? How am I supposed to unify with him then if he keeps doing the same thing over and over again? And that's when Jesus says, don't forgive seven times seven, but 70 times seven. Treat him just as how I treat you. Now, in your, you're a liberal, and in your heart, you just hate those conservatives. You, you, you have... You have been living on the edge of the church because you are just fed up and and you are treating that conservative brother just as how you would not want Christ to treat you when you sin and mess up all the time. And conservative, you've been over there, we could just get rid of those liberals. The Holy Spirit would fall. The shaking would occur and they'd just get out of here. You know, it's like we want the shaking to happen so we can get rid of the people we don't like. Lord, bring the shaking. <laughs> Beloved, we ought to be praying, Lord, let not one soul be lost. Let not one soul be shaken out. And beloved, let us say, let us understand that if we come together on the basic element of our wretchedness, God will bring us into unity on everything else because our hearts would have been humbled and ready to receive him. And so you are treating someone just as how you would not want to be treated, and you want to make an open confession before your brethren and sisters here today and say, Lord, I need to be justified by faith and extend justification by faith to the guy who yelled at me in church last week and treat him just as though he never yelled at me. Would you come down so that we could pray? Now, don't sit there justified. Don't sit there justifying yourself. And if it's not you, then don't come. But if it is you, then come. I want to make another appeal. This is a very special appeal. You have lived your life saying it is impossible to get victory over sin. 
And the reason you have lived that is because you have said to yourself, there is always a reason to sin. I am human and therefore I will sin. Beloved, even being human is not a reason to sin. You can't stand before God on their judgment and say, and God say, why'd you sin? And you say, because I'm human. He's not buying it. If he bought it, he'd let you in. But not even our, our wretched and sinfulness is a reason to sin. And now you're saying, Lord, I want to begin to experience justification by faith. I will no longer justify why I sin. I want to receive your power. If that's you, would you come? Beloved, let me tell you, true perfection comes when the glory of man is laid in the dust because we cannot be perfect. <laughs> we cannot be perfect. It is Jesus in us who is perfect. It is Jesus in us who will work out that perfection. That's why we will always be miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. I will never change. I am still the same Ivor that I was back out in the world, but it is Christ in me that you see, beloved. So no, it's not about you being perfect. It's about letting Christ, the perfect one in you, to work out his perfect will in your life. And he will declare you righteous as you live righteously in him. Amen. And beloved, let me tell you, if we take this home with us today, the devil's power is indeed broken. And I see that chain reaction will begin to move across this planet and there will be nothing that the enemy of souls can do to stop it. My brother, my sister, remember we are a family. I have to love you just like I love my flesh brother. And if my flesh brother was out there doing some crazy thing or thinking some crazy theology, I would still love him just the same. Heavenly Father, we have heard today the third angel's message in verity. The very thing that we must experience before we can give. Lord, it is hard to believe that even after yesterday, you can look at us just as if we'd never sinned. Oh Lord, what a great and incredible truth. May we live out that truth in our lives, treating others. You see things and call things that are not as though they were. So, Father, may we treat others, even though they may not be acting like it. It's not about whether they deserve it, Lord. It's about justification by faith. May we be able to unify as a church, and even greater, I'm praying now, Lord, as a world church. Despite our many differences, may we unite on our own wretchedness and nothingness. And then, Father, finally, I pray that you would make us word. Transform and conform us to the image of your Son. Remind us always, Father, that there is never a reason to sin. Because if there was a reason, it would no longer be sin, but justifiable. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us today. Thank you, Father, for the incredible work you are about to do through your people in these last days on planet Earth. Strengthen this prayer chain that we may bring about that angel with the chain in his hand. And may the devil be bound even now from our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.